Today is Sunday, February 14th, 2021. This is an addition to the class, which we'll be starting in a moment. I want to mention that around the 14-minute point in the talk, we talked about Abraham, and as it is recorded in the 22nd chapter of the book of Genesis, God had promised Abraham that through his son that his offspring would be as numerable as the stars in the sky. And he promises to Abraham and Abraham obviously assumed that that would be through his son Isaac. And then God came and asked Abraham, sacrifice your son to me on a mountain which I will show you. And Abraham was perfectly obedient in following what God requested, this most difficult of tests that God put him through, to sacrifice his only, and as God said, whom you love, his son Isaac, whom he loved, sacrifice him. And I said in the talk around the 14-minute point that Abraham did sacrifice his son Isaac. However, I failed to mention after that how I meant that. And the point I wanted to make, which through a change of thought at the time I forgot to mention, is that Abraham did not in fact sacrifice him, as we all know. What he did, though, is he made the sacrifice inside his will. He was determined. He had perfect resignation, perfect obedience to God's command. When he raised his arm to sacrifice his son Isaac and he was about to strike him, he was not looking around to see if God would be stopping him or if an angel were coming. He was in the act of obeying God, perfect obedience. This is the sacrifice that I talk about in terms of what we need to do in regards to our own life, to sacrifice it first and foremost in regards to our will, that we are resigned to whatever God sends, that we are obedient to God's commands. Our Lord said somewhere in the Gospel, He said, If you love me, keep my commandments. So, as Abraham kept God's command to sacrifice his son Isaac and was in the act of doing it as God commanded, without flinching, without hesitation, perfectly resigned, as I said, so must we be resigned to God and to his holy will in all things in order to reach God, to reach that level of holiness, the level of the interior life, the level of prayer that God intends to raise us if we will be faithful, if we will be obedient to his commands as he requested in the gospel. So that's why I wanted to mention that and to not leave you hanging by my unfinished comments about the sacrifice of Abraham in the Old Testament. Today is Sunday, February 14th, 2021. Today, I wanted to, as I started last week, talk about one of the most beautiful aspects of our faith and our life. And you might think it a little bold of me, but I read a lot, so I I learn through reading, and I've had lots of classes on the interior life and prayer, and maybe I can transfer at least some of the things I learned to you. A lot of what I want to present is not mine, but I want to present it to you to help at this beautiful time of the year. Lent is starting, as you know. And this year it's unique because, maybe it was last year a little too, it's 
Yes, it was last year too, because now we're a little bit more isolated. People are not running out like they used to because of this cold that's going around. And so it gives you more time. If you think about it, it gives you more time for the interior life, more time for solitude. And I know for a lot of people, it's unnerving, very unnerving. There have been lots of problems in families due to this change in lifestyle, which we are being forced to endure, if you want to put it that way. But it has a good aspect to it for those who want to live an interior life. Some people that have wanted to, and they found so much distraction by people, that this has cut lots of that out. And that can be advantageous. The, the subject of prayer is very interesting. Prayer is, in a manner of speaking, one of the most simple things to do. It's the lifting of the mind and the heart to God. He invites us to do it. He has given us grace. If we're in the state of grace, the Holy Ghost dwells in your soul. And as St. Paul says, the Holy Ghost cries out in prayer to God inside of you. That's what St. Paul says. And so prayer, in a sense, is very simple. But yet... At the same time, prayer is very difficult. It has lots of obstacles to its proper understanding and for living the life of prayer. There are many things that will happen to a person, many temptations, if they start, especially if they start to live a deep interior life, a life of prayer, dedicated seriously to God. And I mean seriously, not the average way that people live their life. If people give their life, you want the devil to get after you. Not that you're going to have any unusual experience, but he will tempt in a unique way. He will try to hurt anyone who gives themselves to prayer. But when we give ourselves to prayer... And if we are serious to travel the path of prayer, which I've talked about many classes a year or so ago, about what prayer is to lead to, the steps of prayer. It is not like people think in terms of say your prayers and you, you pray because you are demanded to. You need to. You pray for things that you need. For God's grace to stay in the state of grace. To die in the state of grace. To save our soul. But prayer is much deeper than that. It's an in, it is to lead to an intimate contact with God. An intimate relationship. More intimate than a, a husband and wife. The, these examples of what God placed in in nature is only a shadow of the things of grace. That's what they are. They are to give us a hint. The, the love of a mother or father for a child, for example, is a hint of the depths of God's love for each of us, provided we're in the state of grace. It's an example. It is to show us something. The life of prayer, as St. John of the Cross points out, when he, he drew a picture, he wrote about the most highest levels of prayer. And it's interesting, somebody asked me not too long ago about some of my comments about some authors in the spiritual life that talk about prayer and I made a comment which may sound a little bold or you know, maybe arrogant, I don't know. But I, I said, you can kind of tell that this particular author never reached the level of prayer that others have. 
that they're even speaking about. They haven't reached it. And you can kind of tell that. How do you tell? Because you can read. When you read certain authors that you know for, for sure have reached those levels, you can hear in their words the beauty, not only of the, the beauty of the expression that they use in describing the highest levels of prayer, but you can tell that they have, it's coming from their heart, that they have reached these things, they've tasted them. And other authors you can read, and for example, the one I'm going to bring up today, which I started last week, he, he makes comments about it. And it was a good number of years before he passed away that he wrote this particular book that I brought up last week, How to Pray Always. It's an interesting book. I will point some things out. But he says in there about some people give their life and dedicate themselves and do all the things necessary, but they never reach the slightest or never experience the slightest degree of infused prayer. And he kind of says it begrudgingly almost. You can almost hear it. Now, do I know that for sure? No, I don't. But he doesn't speak about it like some of the other authors that we know have reached those. So you can kind of get a glimpse, possibly. Nothing absolute. And hopefully this man who wrote about it, about how to practice certain things, that hopefully in those remaining years, about 30 years he lived after he wrote this particular book, that hopefully then he reached what he had hoped he could reach, which he spoke about. But St. John of the Cross talks in his books. You can just hear he even says in one of his books at the beginning when he was writing for a mother of a convent, he mentions that you asked me to write about this highest subject, most deep. He says, and I had to wait. I couldn't write until my soul was lifted up. Until he started to enter into that level of prayer. And his soul was lifted up such that he could write. And then a soul like that, St. John of the Cross, writing of the beautiful things that he wrote about. It's, it's alive. It's different than many other authors who speak about it in an intellectual way. In a scholastic way. But not in a manner of speaking in a mystical way. So, everything we've talked about in this class, about doctrine and morals, which we do, the commandments, the sacraments, we've talked lots about them, and we have lots more to speak about. But all those things are in a big way leading souls, hopefully, to this aspect of their life, to the interior life, to a life of prayer. Because that's what you're called to. As our Lord said in the Gospel, pray ye always. Pray always. Never cease. Pray always. And many people, and many of the spiritual writers, especially those that have not tasted, it appears, the mystical state of prayer, they misunderstand and they miss explaining those words of our Lord, it appears. Because other authors explain them well. And there is a way to pray always, which we will talk about. If you're interested, does everyone have this book, My Imitation of Christ? Probably just different translations of the same book. There are many translations of this. I found one last night on the web I was reading about. Very interesting. It goes back to a, one of the earliest authors who translated, I shouldn't say author, but one of the early translators of My Imitation of Christ. And he had a unique style. 
because it was a kind of early English, and it, some of the words he used didn't mistranslate it, but it used it translated it in a unique way. And an Englishman may love it. I found some of the words and the expressions he used to be very, very nice and very sweet in a manner of speaking. This is one I like particularly because of all the pictures in it. Now, if you want to talk about prayer, this book is all about the life of prayer. The first three books, book one, two, and three, are basically related to the three different conversions of the soul as it makes its way to God in a life of prayer. That's what the this book has been explained as. And if you read, for example, in the beginning, a index of the chapters, chapter one, the imitation of Christ and the contempt of all the vanities of the world. And it's very beautiful. This comes from chapter one. He who follows me walks not in darkness, says the Lord. By these words of Christ, we are advised to imitate his life and habits. If we wish to be truly enlightened and free from all blindness of heart, let our chief effort, therefore, be to study the life of Jesus Christ. The teaching of Christ is more excellent than all the advice of the saints, and he who has his spirit will find in it a hidden manna. Now there are many who hear the gospel often, but care little for it because they have not the Spirit of Christ. Yet whoever wishes to understand fully the words of Christ must try to pattern his whole life on that of Christ. This whole first book in my imitation of Christ is about the read, in a sense, dedicating of our life to God. It reminds you a little of Abraham, the father of those who would believe. That's who Abraham is. The, the missal, and in the missal it talks about how in the breviary at this time of the year, before Lent, that we, or the missal and the breviary, review about Abraham, Noah, and Adam, and how they are all three prefigurers of Christ. It goes into some detail. What did Abraham do? The father of the believers. Of those who would be believers in the New Testament too. God asked him to sacrifice his son. And Abraham did. Abraham sacrificed Isaac. It's a, such a moving story to think of and read about how Abraham took his son Isaac to sacrifice him on the mountain. No questions to God. Abraham didn't complain. He didn't question God. God said, sacrifice thy son to me. Even though God had promised that through this son, he would have his offspring as the stars of the sky, the sands and the seashore. And yet, after his son was growing, God says, sacrifice him to me. And as they're walking to the place of sacrifice, to the mount, Isaac says to his father, Father, where are we going to get a lamb to sacrifice to the Lord? Just imagine. I don't know if he would have shed a tear or not, but I think I would have. God will supply, he said. God will supply. So, too, must we sacrifice. That's what in a sense, the first book of my imitation of Christ, the first book they call it, has the four books in it. The first one is about the sacrifice of ourselves, to change our life for God, to dedicate it to Him. As our Lord said in the Gospel, He who loves his life in this world shall lose it. He who loses his life for my sake shall find it. And these things can only be heard by a man of faith, a man of generosity, a man of wisdom. Because many of these things are read to us year after year in the Gospels. And we hear them. 
It's even preached on often, these types of things. But yet men, it appears, do not catch the consequences of the words of Christ. And our Lord explained why. As the, the apostles were complaining to him, why do you speak in parables? So he explained why, which we won't go through now. A next thing that's interesting. These are the things, just making an example, pointing out a couple simple chapters that I found last night. I was just looking through there and I thought, this is perfect. Book 1, chapter 20. The love of solitude and silence. Seek a suitable time for leisure and meditate often on the favors of God. Leave curiosities alone. Read such matters as bring sorrow to the heart rather than occupation to the mind. If you withdraw yourself from unnecessary talking and idle running about, from listening to gossip and rumors, you will find enough time that is suitable for holy meditation. As one man said, as often as I have been among men, I have returned less a man. I have returned less a man. It's true. I don't know about you, but I find that myself. It's hard to get back. If you want a life of prayer, you need to slowly pull yourself away. We often live, I don't know about you, but maybe speaking for myself, we often live in a way that's responsive to the occasions that come up. This happened at this moment, so I do this. This is now happening, so I'm going to do this. But to have a plan, to have a way of life, to have a schedule for oneself that should be followed is very helpful for the interior life. Especially if you want to have a life of prayer. When are you going to pray? When am I going to pray? I need to make for myself a certain schedule. This is my time. I set aside. Nothing else gets in the way of this time. I know in my condition, it may be easier than for some of you. I understand that. But I think if you pray over it and use some generosity, no matter what your conditions are, there is a way to do it. I know some people that had lots of responsibility, many, many children. They got up at a certain time of the day when nobody else was around. Or at night, you come down and you find somebody praying unexpectedly. It's a beautiful thing. And then book three. This is book three. This book is more after what they call the, one of the final conversions of a soul on his way to God and to the, the highest mystical prayers that God gives to some. The authors all say, St. John of the Cross in particular says, and St. Teresa, I believe, copies the same thing, says the same basic thing, all men are called to the highest levels of prayer, but few reach it. Why, we don't know. We don't know. In here is a beautiful chapter. God is sweet above all things, and in all things to those who love him. This is after a soul loves God. Now, not as, as in the beginning when people are young, they often love God, in a sense, as a servant. As a servant. And they do things because they must. They avoid things because otherwise they will be punished. But that all changes when a soul reaches, especially if God touches the soul and gives them the greatest graces of life. The greatest gift of himself in mystic prayer, which we won't get into today. And then the soul says things like this, Behold my God and my all. What more do I wish for? What greater happiness can I desire? O oh, sweet and delicious word, but sweet only to him who loves it, and not to the world or the things that are in the world. My God and my all, these words are enough for him who understands. And for him who loves, it is a joy to repeat them often. 
So, I just wanted to point that out. I used a little longer example than maybe I should have, but this book is part of your traversing. If you have an interest in truly living a life of prayer, delving into it, and if you want to find the most joyous and most happy part of life, the most fulfilling, this is the path, the path of prayer. And I know for a fact that God is very generous. St. Teresa of Avila speaks about it in one of her books or in her biography, about how some of the young ladies who gave up the world to become Carmelites in her Reformed order, how God quickly, within a short time, raised them in prayer to a little higher level than a beginner, let's put it that way, in a short time. Why? Because of the reform of their life. First of all, externally, they gave up everything, left the world, entered a monastery of complete poverty, detachment. And if they did that generously from the heart, then it was an indication, or I should say it was the beginning of what God asks of us. Before God raises a soul to any higher level of prayer, other than what's called ordinary grace, the prayer that we can attain through ordinary grace, before he will raise us up above that, he expects us to do what is within our power to reach the high levels of ordinary prayer by ordinary grace. He expects you to do that. This book will help you to, to do that. It will help you to purge. And other books that I will tell you about and explain as we possibly go on on this subject will give you other things and other books that will help you to reach there. And I will put some of them, I already got some of it on the website. There's a section I'm putting in there that is a review of books and books in there that you can read. Sections of books. Because all these things will help you to learn what you need to know to reach the most beautiful aspect of life. That's why so many are lost today. Very few understand what life's about. The purpose of life. And what God wants to do for your soul. With a little generosity. Now, get into this book that I started last week. How to Pray Always by Raoul Plou. This is the one I was speaking of before. His first chapter is to think always of God is impossible. But he says How to Pray Always is the title of the book. So it's slightly contradictory from the perspective, and this is part of the reason I wanted to bring this up, because you'll run into this, depending upon the author. With ordinary prayer, he points it out, but he's slow in doing it, because his first part, he says, there's a distinction, let's put it, I'll start this, there's a distinction to be made at the outset, which will throw a strong light upon this problem. We must be on our guard to avoid confusing the act of prayer with the state of prayer. Further on, we shall see in what consists the state of prayer. An act of prayer may be either vocal or mental, according as it is formed of words recited by the lips, or is the inner cry of the soul, expressed in formulated or unformulated transports of love, or in the silence of union with God. In these two cases, our thoughts are occupied, or trying to be occupied with God. Our acts of prayer are moments when our thoughts are in loving union with God. The problem is this. Can these moments of loving union with our Lord be brought so close together that they form one almost continuous chain of thought? More briefly, can my thoughts be absorbed without intermission with God? Is it possible to think of nothing but Him? And he's relating that to the title of the book, To Pray Always. And he's saying, are these, is this really possible? It appears he's expressing the title of the book, To Pray Always. But yet he's saying in this first chapter, is that possible? Answer, no. So it's a little confusing. And I wanted to bring it up because it's not confusing as he goes on. 
He unconfuses it. But he does it after saying and giving the impression right away to people that first read the first chapter, that's not possible. So he puts something into your head, which I want to yank out of your head, because you're going to read many books like this. I believe, I believe this book, this book explains similar things. The book, Conversation with Christ, I don't remember the author's name, but it's basically supposed to be a commentary on St. Teresa of Avila about mental prayer. And that's a very good book. This is a very good book. But, and this one is too, Praying Always by Raoul Blue. Very good. However, this is something that you have to be aware of. You should be aware of. Because he kind of corrects it, but after he made a deep impression that you can't pray always. So some people may give up, in a manner of speaking. Here lies a double impediment. First, the practical impossibility. Our daily duties involve a number of actions other than formulated acts of prayer. There may be a lesson to prepare, a lecture. And it is true that it is very difficult to think of one thing while doing another. In most cases, and for most people, an occupation, even when only external, absorbs all our energies, including those of the mind. And then he starts to express more deeply what can happen. Doubtless God can endow the soul with special faculties so as to enable her to live always or near always with the thought of consciousness of his presence. This is what he is, he understands. It appears from more of a, in a sense of, I would say, a scientific way or practical way, but not necessarily a personal way. In such a case, the ability to remain in the presence of a God is not the normal result of our own efforts. It is the action of God who delights in overwhelming the soul. He unfolds it in a recollection that is more or less in impenetrable to outside disturbances. Mystical writers call this infused recollection. To distinguish it from that which is the result of our own efforts and is called acquired recollection, which is Acquired recollection is, in a sense, the highest level of non-infused mystical prayer. It is something that you can attain through ordinary grace. But what he is speaking about here, he's talking about both of these together. And you have to understand that this acquired recollection, God expects us to reach, try to reach this level on our own with what's called ordinary grace acquired recollection, so that we have a near continuous thought about God. Did you ever have anything happen to you in your life? This happens to young men, I know. I, I can speak for young men because I know a little bit about it. I grew up in a big family. And when a young man meets a young lady and he falls head over heels, do you think it's hard or easy for him to get this Newfound love out of his mind. Sometimes it makes young men to act kind of goofy. And I say that in a nice way because it's a beautiful thing about love. It moves the man. And it allows them, that for some, in some way, it makes them think of this person all the time. And that's part of acquired recollection. When the soul comes to the realization and begins to truly and deeply love God and understands by wisdom, by deep wisdom from the Holy Ghost, when he understands that, as the spiritual authors talk about, the one thing necessary. That's how they put it. God, the one thing necessary. It's a beautiful way they put it. Because it's absolutely true. It is the only one thing necessary. The one thing for which you've been created. Then the soul starts, through ordinary grace, to have a semi, at least, recollection of the soul. And it's hard to explain how it happens. But then when they reach infused prayer, Infuse recollection that God sends, if he so desires, if they reach that point, then God gives this special grace he's talking about here. 
he unfolds it in a recollection that is more or less impenetrable to outside disturbances. Mystical writers call this infused recollection to distinguish it from that which is the result of our own effort and is called acquired recollection. This recollection can, can progress from the simple mystic touch, which is temporary and often of very short duration, to a union that is continuous. In this case, recollection is permanent, suffering no eclipse of the beloved presence and its enjoyment. At first, this may lead to moments of such entire absorption that the soul is more or less unfitted to take its place in its accustomed surroundings. That which is seen within is so different from the painted canvas of the outside world. But in the highest stage of union, the soul finds it can easily adjust its sense life to harmonize with its supernatural life. Outwardly, it behaves like everyone else, while keeping within perpetual contact with the Divine Master. It is bound and it is free, and all the freer for being bound to him who is sovereign liberty, on whom it is entirely dependent. The masters of the spiritual life are unanimous in recognizing that persons who are favored with this highest degree of union with God are rare. They are less in agreement over the question as to whether there are few or many who are endowed with periods of infused recollection. They are unanimous in reckoning that in all probability this infused power of recollection is unattainable by human means, that none can claim it as a right, however great their efforts may have been. And that is absolutely true. All the spiritual writers speak about it. There is no attaining this as, in a sense, a right. If I've done these things and I've lived this way, that's what this priest even speaks about here. We walk by faith as wayfarers in this world. To say that every mortified soul is called upon to quit this life of faith and enter now into direct possession is to turn these persons into merely semi-wayfarers. Why? Because no longer are they living, in a manner of speaking, by pure faith. They have a sense of God's presence that leads them all the time that is with them. Another objection is that there are persons who have practiced detachment during the course of a long life, yet in spite of apparently being quite suitable, they have never experienced even the shadow of a mystical favor. And that's true. There are probably people like that. However, God calls many. St. John of the Cross says God calls all. But very few find it. And as I was mentioning right at the beginning, what has slipped my mind, St. John of the Cross does speak about, and he writes or draws a picture in his book about the summit of holiness and the path to get there. And he draws a mountain. It's a hand sketch by St. John. Very interesting. Puts a lot of things on it about the virtues and the gifts of the Holy Ghost and how they interact. But he has three paths up the mountain. One going up the center, one going up on the right side, one going up on the left. The one on the left goes up and falls off a precipice. The one on the right goes up and stops. Never reaches the summit. And he said that ones in the center may reach the summit. And he shows and he explains the obstacles that souls have. And one of the biggest obstacles he complains about, probably for pages, is a lack of direction. Lack of somebody to teach and to show souls the path to holiness in prayer. The life of prayer. How to reach it. How to overcome the obstacles that they will find. To understand as they traverse the path, why this is happening, why that's happening, why am I stagnant all of a sudden? I've had people tell that to me. Please, don't be worried. This is part of the path to prayer. You need to go through it. God 
once you attached to nothing except himself. That's it. He is very jealous. And when a soul says that they want to give themselves, he holds them to it. You want to give yourself? Not 99%. It's got to be all. Or with God, it's all or nothing. And St. John of the Cross points it out in one little thing he says. He says, many souls that are along this path, but he says they're held down like a little bird with a simple little thread, but they're unwilling to break that thread. That little thread will hold the bird back from flying. It can't. Neither will the soul fly to God as he wants. Unless they break that thread. So St. John of the Cross made lots of complaints about us. Because of our lack of generosity. Perfect detachment from the world. From ourselves. From those that we love. To love them, not that we don't love them, but if you seek and pursue the, the life of prayer, those whom you love, you will love more perfectly, more purely, more generously, more selflessly. Love demands that. True love demands selfless love. Self-sacrificing so a parent knows, and it breaks a parent's heart. I've heard parents, my parents probably said it to me. It breaks my heart to have to beat you. But I have to. If I'm going to make something good out of you, we've got to correct you. But they're the best parents. So, he says here, this is not the place in which to take part in a discussion of this sort. In every case, infused recollection, whether it be the normal outcome of acquired recollection or not, is in itself and by right independent of our own efforts, so that it is impossible to lay down technical rules concerning it, and still less to give any infallible advice as how to prepare for it. I disagree with him. He was a Jesuit. I'm ignorant of the different orders from the point of view of what they encourage their men to read, for example, or their women to read when they're in these orders. Did the Jesuits encourage St. John of the Cross? Because he's kind of like, I, I don't know. St. Bernard, he is Cistercian. So, I don't know if they all encourage it. Maybe he didn't read St. John of the Cross, or he didn't remember it. But St. John of the Cross gives great advice. Is it infallible that you'll re reach it? Like he says here. No. Absolutely not. As he said, there are many that prepare themselves and they appear to be, appear to be prepared and done what they needed to do. And they would expect that God would favor them. But he doesn't. St. John on the Cross says, we don't know why. St. Teresa Avila says, we don't know why, but it's not God's fault. That's all we can say. So, there is more here, which is important. And I am taking lots of time to go through this in the beginning. But I think it's helpful. Because if we can, as individuals, understand not only the importance, but the necessity of reaching the goal of our life by potentially a change in our life, a rededication, a redirection, of our whole life to that which is, as the spiritual writers say, the one thing necessary to God. If, God willing, I hope, that maybe through my little words here, that relaying what I have read, basically, and studied, that even if just one of you who might listen to this, just one would even come close to reaching halfway up the ladder of perfection and union with God. 
that person could not only change families, parish, city, could change a country because of God's loving goodness to those that that person prays for, suffers for, lives for, when he first lives and suffers for the love of God. I have to let you go. Sorry for keeping you so long. We will continue next week if you don't mind. Thank you for coming. Thank you. You're welcome.